our format today is uh, is informal, and we hope it will be uh, uh, engaging for you and for our panelists. Uh, we've invited uh, four uh, panelists to come today prepared to make some observations, comments, responses uh, to the text, which is The New Chinese Empire by Ross Terrell. Uh, let me just give you a, a brief biography of, uh, of Mr. Terrell so you'll know a little bit more about him. Ross Terrell authored The New Chinese Empire, which won the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. Mao, a biography, and China in our time, to name only a few. Uh, he is he's well known um, as an informed Chinese scholar and, and China watcher, as, uh, as Eric tells me that the correct term is. Um, a, few, uh, a regular visitor to China for over 30 years, his articles have been published in the Atlantic Monthly, Foreign Affairs, The New Republic, National Geographic, and other national and, I might add, international magazines. He has appeared on CBS News, The Today Show, Nightline, as a special commentator, and he has testified before the U.S. Congress. He is currently in a research position at uh, Harvard University and alternates between Harvard and the University of Texas at Austin. Um, today, our panelists include, uh, to my far left, uh, Dr. Michael Murdoch, Professor of History, Dr. Stephen Wright, Professor of Chinese in the Department of Asian Near Eastern Languages, uh, Dr. Eric Heyer, Professor of Political Science, and uh, Susan Gong, a lecturer from the Foreign Service Institute. Um, what I'd like to do is, is uh, turn the time over, I believe, to Eric first, uh, ask them to come up to the podium, make just a brief five to ten minute statement, response, and comments about the book. Uh, we'll rotate through each of the panelists, and then we'll have a few minutes for the panelists to respond to one another. Uh, if anything that one of the panelists has said sparks an interest or a comment or a follow-up, uh, we'll have a few minutes for that, and then we'll open it up to you for questions. So uh, that's our format. As I said, it's, it's pretty informal, uh, but we'll, we'll start with Eric and go from there. I guess since I walked in last, I get to go first. <laughs> well, um, for the record, uh, Corey can tell you that I'm the one that encouraged him to uh, choose this book, The New Chinese Empire, for the book of the semester and bring Ross Terrell here to speak. About um, 25 years ago, he came to BYU. And at the time, I remember challenging him on one of his points. And when he comes back, I'll have several more I'll want to challenge him on, too. But... Uh, while my comments on the book may appear to be somewhat negative, let me say I think it's a nice, broad-ranging book. Let me start out by putting the book in some historical context. Um, it certainly fits in the genre that's very popular in the United States now, which is basically a, China, a book which will bash China, make China look, at, look to be a big threat. Um, this, is, this is nothing new. We, we tend to do this with, uh, with other countries also. Uh, I remember... And let me read from the uh, part of the uh, a review of a book that was published in, in the late 1980s. Uh, it says, this disturbing book offers an original penetrating analysis of the future of U.S.-Japan relations. The U.S. will no longer endure Japan's economic encroachments. Japan, meanwhile, in order to ensure the influx of raw materials and to secure an export market, it can dominate politically, will solidify its trading bloc in Southeast Asia and the Indian Ocean while challenging U.S. hegemony in the Pacific Basin. As U.S. converts its global military supremacy into economic leverage, America and a rearmed Japan will be set on a collision course. The rivalry between them will spill over into hot war. This scenario is plausible and is buttressed by an, uh, uh, by an appraisal of the two nations' conflicting imperial ambitions from the 1890s to the present. Who in the 1960s could have predicted that America, 20 years later, would be in retreat, defeated by the Vietnamese and reeling before the Iranians? This plausible scenario that takes Japan and the United States on a downward spiral from trade friction to protectionism to armed showdown over markets, raw materials, is a great read. Well, let's flash forward then to, uh, 19, uh, to 2005 and said, it says, in a speech Rumfield gave on June 4th at a strategy conference in Singapore, after reviewing current security issues in Asia, especially the threat posed by a nuclear North Korea, Rumsfeld turned his attention to China. The Chinese can play a constructive role in addressing these issues, he observed. A candid discussion of China cannot neglect mention, to mention areas of concern to the region, however. In particular, China appears to be expanding its missile forces, allowing them to reach targets in many areas of the world, and is otherwise improving its ability to project, to project power into the region. Then, with consummate disingenuousness, Rumsfeld asked, 
Since no nation threatens China, one must wonder why this growing investment, why, this con, why these continuing large and expanding arms purchases, why these continuing robust deployments. The Pentagon's report on China's combat capabilities, titled The Military Power of the People's Republic of China, concludes that the pace and scope of China's military buildup are already such as to put regional military balances at risk. The report states, current trends in China's military modernization can provide China with a force capable of, of prosecuting a range of military operations in Asia, well beyond Taiwan, potentially posing a credible threat to the modern militaries operating in the region. So you can see that from Japan threat, now, we're to, now we've moved on to China threat. And this book fits very well into that. Ross Terrell is, is, is certainly playing to the crowd. And uh, no wonder the people at the LA Times, the LA Times thought it was such a great book. Um, let me turn my comments now for, a few, for just a few minutes to some specific things in the book after setting this context within, this book, within which I think we need to understand this book, this, this very appealing and alarming threat of China and the coming war with the United States. Um, Terrell's a bright, articulate, uh, good writer, and he picks and chooses catchphrases that grasp our attention. One that's been grasping people's attention for years that he repeats is the one by the famous Chinese scholar, well, scholar of China, Lu Xunpai, he's not Chinese, <laughs> where he says, China is a civilization pretending to be a nation. I actually don't know what that means. A civilization pretending to be a nation. Like India is a civilization pretending to be a nation. Egypt is a civilization pretending to be a nation. I have no idea what that really means. But it's catchy, isn't it? So in this book, Ross Terrell, he presents China as this exotic place that's really a civilization, not truly a nation. Difficult to understand with this complex imperial history that, that, that echoes today with its imperial ambitions around the world. And it's not really a nation state. Well, if China's not a nation state, I don't know what qualifies as a nation state then. I mean, it is a member of the Security Council. It's a member of the WTO. We recognize it as a nation state. So I guess we've just recognized a civilization and not a state. So, so much for that. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, but those kinds of words echo on through the book. Um, here's one other one. Um, let me see. Some say the Qing, meaning the Qing dynasty, some say the Qing was an empire rather than a dynasty. I don't know what that means either. An empire rather than a dynasty. Manchu rule, writes Evelyn Rowski, was a creative adaptation of problems of rulership. It was not simply a repetition of the dynastic cycle. So, so now he may, says the Qing was really not a dynasty. It was just a, it was an empire. And since, Chi, and since the PRC has in, in, inherited the, the Qing empire, China today under the communists is, is just another empire. Um, specifically, based upon this argument that China is really an empire, it's not a nation, it's really a civilization that has grandiose ideas about its uh, central place in the world, he sets up this argument that China, under the, under the communists, will be expansive. And he says, um, yet the PRC has put the world on notice that it expects to acquire more territory than it presently holds. Taiwan will be acquired next. Other territories will follow. If China becomes a superpower, the account will be presented to the world. Um, so he projects a China that will be expansive and take on territory. Um, he goes on and says, among the major countries, only China grinds away at the identity of small nations by incorporating them into an empire in the name of an anti-imperialist revolutionary nation state. Um, well, maybe Ross Terrell didn't, didn't read the recent documents that China has sound, signed boundary treaties with every single one of its neighbors except for India that the United States never did recognize Tibet as an independent nation from China. The United States never has recognized Taiwan as an independent nation from China. We've always recognized those as part of the one China that Ross Terrell talks about. Uh, the only boundary that China hasn't settled is with India, and that's probably more, that's a, both a Chinese and an Indian problem. And then there's the issues in the South China Sea, 
with territories and some islands and things that, are, that they're all disputing. And the Taiwanese also dispute and claim to be part of China. Uh, the PRC gave up its claim to Mongolia long before the Republic of China on Taiwan ever gave up its claim to Mongolia. And so uh, Terrell sort of gives, leaves us with this image that China is, is an empire. It's not really a nation. It's a grandiose civilization that sees itself as the center of the world. And given the power, will inevitably expand and, and take territories surrounding it. And, it. and he makes that argument based upon an argument that is, is indirectly refer, referenced by democratic peace arguments, that since China is not a democracy, of course they'll be aggressive, because democratic nations don't fight other nations. Only non-democratic nations fight other nations. And so since China is really an empire, not a state, and it's a, it's a communist empire, not a democratic one, it will therefore be aggressive. And so we're left with, the, with this conclusion that China will, that, that there is a coming war with China. And... Um, and I don't agree with that argument, uh, but it certainly fits into the neoconservative view of China today. Um, in conclusion, let me just point out that the list of people who endorse the book is, says a lot about the book. Endorsements come from the Washington Times, a conservative newspaper in Washington, D.C., run by the Moonies. It comes from the, the, the American Enterprise, a publication of the American Enterprise Institute, the think tank for the neocons. And, it, and it's endorsed by the Weekly Standard, a newspaper for the neocons. Uh, so the list of people who endorse the book are all on the conservative, neoconservative side and, 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 and project China as a threat because it is communist, because it is uh, not democratic, uh, because it is really an empire, not a nation. And so be aware when you read, I encourage you to read the book. Be aware of where Ross Terrell is coming from. Be aware of the genre within which it fits, the very popular uh, China threat genre, which is an echo of the Japan threat genre of two decades ago. Thanks. You know, in some ways, I think Ross Terrell really takes has it both ways because when he talks about China as a threat internationally, he gathers the acclaim of all of the neoconservatives. And when he talks about the abuses of human rights within China, he gathers the acclaim of newspapers like the LA Times. And so, you know, he's really working with both sides of the equation at the same time. This is a book that is deliberative, deliberatively and I think um, kind of refreshingly provocative in some ways because those of us who've been China watchers for a long time um, know how hard it is to say those politically incorrect things that Ross Terrell says in the book. Let me give you some of the examples of what he says. He says that um, his main purpose, he tells you in the introduction, is to show that the fundamental features of the Chinese party state combine Leninism with Chinese autocratic traditions. And these explain much of the domestic and foreign policy in China today. So he goes on to say that the Chinese state of today is an anachronism. It hovers between a set of unsustainable authoritarian traditions and an elusive modern political form to match its now transformed society and economy. It's neither established a worthy or a just political system nor adapted to being a nation state. I mean, these are all very provocative, partially true statements. Domestically, China is an oppressive state afraid of its own people. Only authoritarian rule keeps multiple cultures obedient to a single center. Um, China is a paternalistic state, repressive. This is a contradiction with a loosened society and a freer economic, um, freer economy. China is dysfunctional in a world of nation states. I, I agree with Eric that you have to have a very sort of post 21st century view of what constitutes a legitimate nation state if you don't understand that China can act legitimately in the international realm even though it's not a liberal democracy. <clears throat> and um, one of his last contentions, the Han communist-led universalism is doomed. Um, so as you can see, these are all provocative statements and I think intentionally so. And for those of us who go to banquets with Chinese and hear them um, repeat the myths of the, em of the empire that China has never been aggressive to any other nation or that, um, um, that it's an evolving democracy when the in the political realm things really haven't changed. When you hear these sort of platitudes being sp spouted off, you're very happy to have somebody come out and say, well, you know, there's really another way to look at it. Having said that, 
there's a lot in this that I don't agree with, and I'll just make three quick points. Um, the first is that Terrell's description of what's happening in China, particularly on the domestic side, um, I'm less familiar with international relations, I look at China uh, domestic questions, is a very incomplete description of what's going on. Um, I think very few people would, t would talk in terms of increased sphere of human rights in China or political freedoms, but the number of personal freedoms, the amount of personal space that people have to work in within contemporary Chinese culture is vastly broader than it was a decade ago or two decades ago, and certainly um, when you compare to the 60s and 70s, it's vastly broader. Uh, one very refreshing thing that you see is people are not only willing to speak their mind even to foreigners, but people in official capacities, um, people who work in the think tanks of the Chinese government are willing to speak truth to power. If you look at the reports that have been written recently in, for the Public Security Bureau um, analysis by the analysts within the Public Security Bureau talking about the reasons for the incredible increase in instances of domestic unrest. The, the Public Security Bureau is reporting this year 74,000 instances of public unrest throughout China. That's a huge number. And their analysis of why that's happening is no longer the standard black hands from the outside or imperialist intervention. They're talking about social problems, political problems that are causing people to um, come to the government to have the issues addressed. And so this internal analysis, which is now looking not just at the old um, political, ideological view of the world, I think is a, is a hopeful and a hopeful sign that there is some real change in China. That the people within the positions of power in China, I'm not talking about the elitist um, standing committee of the Politburo, but I'm talking about those who advise, those who make decisions, the, the 30, 40, 50 somethings within the bureaucracy of China have a, a broader, more enlightened um, outlook on life. So while there are not political, there are not a lot of um, concrete political structural changes you can point to. You can point to changes within the way the society functions and the way analysis happens to see that there really are changes in China. So the first thing I would say is Ross, Pro, uh, Ross Terrell's um, <laughs> analysis is it, descriptions are incomplete. There's been a lot of social change that um, has increased the sphere of freedom and personal space for most of the Chinese people. <clears throat> which, uh, you know, I'm not an apologist for the repression that is still very real in China, but you have to acknowledge that that space has opened up. Uh, the second point I would make is that China really is going where no one has gone before. To take a country of 1.3 billion people from what was a very um, ideologically based autocratic authoritarian regime and bring it into the 21st century is something that hasn't really happened before. And it's never, the, the examples that we've had um, of countries moving from this ideological base, you'd have to include Russia, you'd have to include Taiwan, <clears throat> probably have to include Korea in that because they moved from autocratic, ideologically based governments into a more modern world. Some of that hasn't been all um, easy. And the Chinese look at that and aren't sure that's the path they want to follow when you look at the political instability in Russia and the economic turmoil that um, has happened since, China, that since Russia became a democracy. Um, the Chinese aren't sure that's exactly the path they want to take. They are groping for stones as they cross the river. And the shore that they're reaching for on the other side is not clear. I mean, we don't know that what we're look, working towards is a liberal democracy um, in a Western fashion. So there, there is a lot of tentativeness, and there are huge problems to deal with as they move um, across that river. And so um, I would challenge anybody to come up with an immediate solution for how we get from where we are to where China wants to be or where we want China to be. <clears throat> um, and thirdly, I would just say that it's not just the state that is fearful of this process. When you talk to Chinese people, um, the question of instability, and you know, this may be of uh, opinion that is mostly born of propaganda, but could well be born of the experience that China's lived over the last hundred years. The prospect of instability, particularly in urban China, is a terrifying thing to most Chinese. And um, most of them look and wonder who can keep things together if it's not the party, 
the state at the, at the moment. So for this, this notion that um, only the government, on, only the authoritarian repressive regime is what's keeping people looking to the center for um, stability, I think is not quite a fair thing to say. There are huge problems of unemployment, huge problems of um, inequality of, in, <clears throat> of income and resources that are growing in China. The um, Gini coefficient in China, the measurement of rich versus poor is expanding at a very fast rate in China. China with its population and with its essentially 150 million underemployed people in the countryside and 15 million urban youth entering the labor market every year has to have an economy that's expanding, continually expanding in order to absorb all of that and move it forward. Now that's not to say that you couldn't do that without the levels of repression that exist in Chinese society, but it is to say it's an enormous challenge. And I, you know, when we used to live in China, we would often go to see the acrobats at Tiananmen, which were the old-fashioned Chinese acrobats, and you'd have this little unicycle come out with one man riding it, and then improbably there'd be two or three women who would jump on top, and then five more, and then ten more. And I think that's kind of a, um, an analogy of how the Chinese think about the economy, that as long as it's moving forward, you can have this balance, this momentum, to keep things stable enough that the bicycle won't fall over. But if it were to, if it were to slow or if it were to stop, then everybody would tumble down and it would, you know, it, it's a real image that I think is very, um, for the Chinese people, a genuine fear. It's not just the government that fears this. The Chinese people fear this. And it's partly because of prejudices between the city and the countryside. And it's a complex issue, but... Um, not just the government that fears instability in China. So having said that, I'll turn the time over to my colleague. Who, who's first? I'm thrilled at the chance to speak third, one of the few times that a historian gets the final word over a political scientist. <laughs> um, as a historian, I read Ross Terrell's book with great interest and found history as a common thread through the whole thing. On page 81, he said the following, uh, pre referencing a Chinese quote, history is a maiden, you can dress her up however you please. Uh, if the metaphor were applied to Terrell's book, the young lady that would be produced would be banned from BYU because she simply wouldn't have enough on to be able to walk around campus. He represents history so scantily and so selectively, big sections are skipped over. Um, I found the book emotional, filled with personal anecdote, lots of exclamation points, undisguised outrage at Beijing, very much out of sync with the objective scientific voice of a professional analyst, more like a shrill journalist. I found it schematic. Uh, virtually every chapter has, there are three reasons why, there are four problems here. Uh, you could boil it down like an ugly pedigree chart with lines and boxes that take very complex historical snarls and summarize them in two or three bullet points. I found it deterministic, representing China as unavoidably centralist because that's what Chinese are by definition, circular logic. Uh, historical figures auto automatically fall to authoritarianism because that's what historical figures in China do. Uh, I didn't like the unholy union between history and political science. He's, I found that he was standing on with one leg on thin ice, scanty history, with the other leg in quicksand, unable to reach the shore, which is guesswork about the future. And in some respects, Terrell's book is extremely hypocritical. He's guilty of the same distortions that he accuses the Chinese of committing, stretched historical truths, a sense of superiority, nationalistic sentiment, etc., etc., uh, ironically, these points are exactly why I thought the book was magnificent. <coughs> Clearly, Ross Terrell understands the relationship between history and power. And to me, the fact that he has all of these failings gives him credibility and does not necessarily detract from the book. It has an influence that you could never get by quantifying conditions in China or approaching it using macro theory. He uses history, that's the underlying foundation, and knows how to derive power from it rather than just suck it dry by dissecting its various pieces. Um, he says that history is a maiden. I'd like to add kind of an irreverent borrowing from Chiang Kai-shek's blue shirts. 
I would say that he uses history like a John Deere tractor. You can use it to plow crops and feed people, or you can use it to tear their houses down. Uh, he, he, he doesn't mess around. He doesn't pull his punches. There are two types of history that I teach my students. One substantiates values, cements identity, sustains or changes the status quo, the power structure that may be. History is power, in other words. The other is a scientific-like quest for truth via observation and evidence gathering. Um, what really happened might be used to describe that branch. Uh, incidentally, BYU has both varieties of history. That's why BYU has two history departments, the one that I belong to and then church history, which is a totally different animal. Uh, China has occasionally sought to know what really happened in its past, but it has always used history as a form of power. And that, in some respects, put us, puts us as Americans at a disadvantage because we predominantly, well, we do use history as power. Uh, the accepted standard of history is the more scientific model. Anything is possible. All opinions are potentially true. <clears throat> Truth is somewhere in the middle. Contrast that to Beijing, in which there is one truth, one explanation, one interpretation, and that makes us automatically weak in a conflict over interpreting history. Uh, we defer, we ignore, we ho-hum, we say, yeah, that, I guess that might be true if you put it in that light. Uh, Beijing unwilling to move means that we do have room to, roo room to move. And that gives Beijing in struggles, uh, especially in historical interpretations, uh, leverage and position of power that we don't have. And one thing I like about Terrell is he plays the game on their level by their rules. And uh, in some respects, I think it's, that's brilliant and necessary. And remember that because I'll come back to that point. A couple of the insights that I thought particularly cogent in this argument today or in this presentation is uh, China's ability to draw strength from weakness. Beijing's separation of words from deeds, action and intent. <clears throat> the Chinese, as uh, Terrell aptly shows, have long outmaneuvered Americans on the uh, political stage, not in military and political terms, not, not even in economic terms, but certainly in identity terms and certainly in propaganda terms. Even when far weaker than its rivals, the Chinese are able to extract some degree of power, and that gives them advantage. In fact, it is the advantage of the autocratic state. If you have control over what people think and know, you can turn popular forces and animosity on and off like a lever. Uh, my research focuses on China in the 1920s when China's condition was even weaker than it is now. Yet even during the 20s, uh, Sun Yat-sen's revolutionary movement was able to play both sides of the fence to manipulate action and deed in such a way that allowed them to survive when they really shouldn't have. No betting observer of the nationalist movement in Canton in 1924 would have given them a, a snowball's chance. There was just no way they were going to survive with all the enemies lined up against them. And yet they did. And part of the reason was being able to play uh, weakness into strength. Just to give you an example, uh, the nationalists were very effective at sending mass organizations, student organizations in particular, to assail mission institutions. At the exact same time that the revolutionaries were encouraging these uh, agitative attacks, they were also approaching the missionaries and saying, gosh, we're sorry these, you're facing these attacks. That's too bad. We'll, we'll help you out if. And that if is what gave the nationalists the ability to survive during those crucial months, 1924, 1925. Uh, today, you don't see that as much, but you do see the manipulation of history. Um, not what happened, of course. You can't change that. But how it is remembered can easily be manipulated, can be dressed up any way that you want, any way that you please. Uh, Lu Xun talked about AQ and criticized the Chinese tendency to distort reality. Um, China does the same thing in some respects, distorting the reality of what happened in order to create security, even victory, out of defeat. And when you don't have political or economic or military might, popular memory is still a very powerful force. Culture will allow you to create nation when nothing else will. Uh, Chatterjee, uh, Partha Chatterjee wrote a book on Indian nationalism that described how Gandhi was able to create an Indian nation on nothing more than a few vague notions of culture because he had zero political 
military or economic might. And uh, he was very successful. And the Chinese are equally successful in their manipulation of culture. Uh, the scary part that I found in uh, Tyrrell's book, the part that uh, concerned me the most, was history as a form of entitlement. The ability to manipulate history is great power. It shapes the way that people think. <clears throat> to give you a crude example, but one that was kind of close to home, I was in Chengdu in 1986. A friend of mine, an American, clearly American, white, blonde, big nose, the whole nine yards, uh, bought a Mickey Mouse-shaped ice cream cone from a vendor and, and gave it to a child on the street. Um, a near, nearby a man saw this incident, jumped over, grabbed the ice cream cone, and smashed it into the pavement. And I thought about that a long time, and I finally realized uh, he evidently was offended by a foreigner giving something to a Chinese kid. He so hated let's say, this notion of imperialist, foreigner as imperialist, that he couldn't see an act of sharing an ice cream cone with anything except of, of an offense against China's uh, well-being, China's pride. Uh, there's great power there if China wants to manipulate it. <coughs> the idea, the notion that Chinese have a right to be anti-foreign because of the abuses that they faced under imperialism. The problem is, is that the notion of imperialism itself, the memory of imperialism, is a distortion. Created for political purpose, created for power. The act of revenge, the act of anti-foreignism is against real people in real time, but the motivation itself was a fabrication, was a distortion. Historical memory may in some respects reflect the past, but imperialism is never as bad as the textbooks in China make it out to be. Uh, missionaries are denounced and condemned for things that, for in exercising influences that no emperor in China ever had. How could a handful of uh, scattered missionaries divided by denomination and language, how could they possibly affect the kind of injurious results that the Chinese government accuses them of? They become a scapegoat, uh, which gives the regime great power. Uh, especially when you combine it with this sense of us versus them, which Gerald focuses on. Uh, family, empire as family. The feelings of the Chinese people are injured. Uh, that's, you know, who's, who's to know what the Chinese feel? But as long as the state can maintain that, it gives them an extension through culture, through family, through history. It gives them an extension uh, of influence that is uh, quite powerful. Now, uh, Terrell does sound a call of warning. He's like the cry of the crazy man in the wilderness. In some ways, he, re he reminds me of Jeremiah. All is doom. All is going to fail. Uh, the words sting. They cause some disbelief, but they do allow us to act. <coughs> and uh, I'd like to take some issue with him because, like my colleagues, Eric and Susan, I, of course, don't buy everything he buys, but at the same time, he claims that the, uh, the party state is going to collapse. That's one of my biggest problems with the book. Maybe as soon as 2007. <clears throat> this assumes a worst case scenario uh, in its absolutist form. There's a lot of other factors that may change the trajectory. Communist pragmatism, ideas of federalism, the minorities, synergies. already talked about the impact that synergy had in changing China. Uh, all of these could in some ways create a future that will be quite different from the way that he's portrayed. Uh, I also was concerned about the way that the book leaves the impression that China has only one way. The Chinese are stuck in a rut, a deterministic rut. They will be autocratic and authoritarian, whether it's due to geography or lack of alternatives, whatever, uh, forever. He doesn't explain why. And uh, in some respects, I think that needs to be addressed. That's the step that needs to be taken at this point. If you look in history, there are a lot of indications that federalism or even popular sovereignty were on the table and were valiantly being considered. In fact, Sun Yat-sen, when he tried to establish a revolution between 1911 and 1923, when he finally aligned with the communists, saw democracy as China's future and did everything in his power to implement it. He just couldn't get it to work uh, at the time for reasons that I won't go into here. Taiwan, at one point, started from the same roots as the People's Republic of China. 
had shared the same historical figures and the same decision makers for a period of its early history. Taiwan was able to move from a dictatorship to a democracy, all because of one man, Jiang Jingguo. Perhaps that one man is just waiting to emerge into power in China. Uh, given some international stability, given some economic growth, who's to say what the future in China could hold? Historians need to examine points where history has gone the other way to balance out Terrell's kind of gloom and doom perspective. But I like it, nonetheless, for uh, two reasons. One, one of the powers that China has in its representation of history is the autocratic state. It can claim to speak for the feelings of the Chinese people. It can claim national interests. <clears throat> the value or the strength of the American position is not in its unity, it's in its disunity. One day you'll have Clinton in the White House and the next day you'll have Bush. And holy cow, the two are so different in the way that they approach the world. That keeps uh, the Chinese thinking. They don't really know what we think. You could think anything. We reverse ourselves, we go opposite directions all the time. We're like Mao when he was in power. Don't ever let people know what you think. It keeps them on their heels and keeps them unbalanced. And that's the beauty of America. We have no idea what we really think. It's just defined by moment and opportunity. Uh, and in that regard, Terrell's voice represents an important end, I'll call it, of that spectrum, one of the possibilities of the future. Uh, on the Chinese side of the equation, Terrell's criticisms, in some regards, uh, force the Chinese polity, Chinese decision makers, to accept criticism that they won't get from inside the country itself. Yes, he calls the Chinese to task. He, he does it unfairly. He pulls all punches. He takes a few dirty shots. <clears throat> he certainly distorts history. Uh, and maybe that's what they need to hear. Maybe the Soviet Union has been posited as, as a good non-example, something that we don't want to follow. Perhaps Terrell's future is a good non-future, and the Chinese decision makers that maybe encounter it, if they're lucky enough to do so, will take steps to avoid it. Terrell, uh, an alarmist, but nonetheless an important voice, one that needs to be represented, even in the way he presents history. Thank you. I feel like the guest who has come late at the Chinese banquet and is left to cobble together a meal out of what is left. Um, it's fair to say about Terrell's book that it's not quite that bad a situation. The eaters were not as hearty as some, and not like the missionary crew that descends upon you and consumes all your food. But the book has enough, a lot of things to say about it, and I'd like to touch on um, some light motifs that come up in the in the book. Ross Terrell is, as uh, Dr. Hires pointed out, is what is called a China watcher. A China watcher is a term that allows you to feel better about not being a journalist per se, but at the same time not feel I'll be chauvinistic, as good about being a scholar about China. So that means he comes with something of a uh, more than, he's not just a journalist, he knows a reasonable amount about China in spite of his shortcomings, which I think have been well pointed out. I think he does a very interesting job of summarizing China's past, um, telegraphic and, and short, shortened though it might be. And I think he deserves credit by trying to put China today into the context of China yesterday and how it kind of follows along. Certainly some of the continuities he plays up are perhaps a bit stretched, but nonetheless I think they're worth looking at. Um, the imperial state, which he brings up quite a bit, um, he brings up his, and he talks about the concepts of unity and stability and the fact that the Chinese government emphasizes these. And I think these are certainly you know, worthwhile points. I don't think most countries want to be unstable and disunified. I don't think that's usually a good model for, polit for politics. I think it is fair to say, however, the Chinese government has gone to great lengths to try and push those forward um, and at times override certain regional, ethnic, and even one would say political diversities that exist that don't serve state interests. And I think that's certainly true, and it has been true not just today, but in the past as well. Um, the government is, in fact, at times all intolerant of alternative views, though I think Susan makes an excellent point in saying that on a private level, people today have much more freedom than they did under the uh, leadership of Mao Zedong or uh, any time in the last 30 years, not to mention maybe 50 years or even a century. <laughs> 
Um, China has a policy also, and this comes out in this imperial mode of lecturing the world, and if you've heard any of the foreign, whenever the Ministry of Foreign Affairs makes a statement, it's almost painful to, to listen to. Uh, one has the feeling they're speaking at times to children. Uh, but there's a paternalistic nature of the Chinese state in this official mode, particularly in, le- in lecturing other nations that do, po- do things that are not to their liking. They, they're seen in some respects as lesser nations. This harks back to this earlier imperial mode as well. So the, 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 the central nation has a better sense of what's going on, and you're doing things that are somehow not in harmony with it. As I think Dr. Murdoch has pointed out, history and geography have been manipulated. Uh, Maps have been redrawn basically to show a Chinese past that justifies what Terrell interprets as imperialist pretensions, where those pretensions are as as well-founded as he argues. Certainly from time to time, the fact that China now rules Tibet, now rules uh, uh, Xinjiang province, uh, uh, province largely of Turkic peoples, Inner Mongolia, countries which really don't have that much of a cultural or his even historic connection to China. The connection is tenuous. These connections are solidified by um, by uh, revisionist map making and history writing. Um, also, um, I'm normally teaching a culture class in just a few minutes, and so my culture students are here. And so, to continue a theme we've talked about before. Um, I would point out that uh, the one China policy, which Terrell talks a great deal about, uh, has been a useful tool in exaggerating China's history. You know, if you have talked to Chinese people, oh, China has a long and continuous history. Well, it isn't all that continuous. It is long, and depending on how you interpret the archaeological evidence, it could be longer or or shorter. It's certainly a rich history. It's certainly a a history um, that rivals anything that's out there. But um, these facts have been interpreted to serve uh, at various times certain very uh, real needs of uh, holding a, a large and disparate state together. Finally, the one thing that's interesting uh, is the whole idea of the great projects. Um, we think of the Great Wall and the Grand Canal. These are important projects that serve national defense and communication and transportation purposes. Um, it's interesting to note that China has never fully got beyond the great projects. You know, under the Republican era, there was the building of the tomb of Sun Yat-sen and the building of the the national capital in Nanjing. Under the People's Republic of China, we have the 10 great projects that were built and completed around 1959, including the Great Hall of the People. You also have, um, today, the Three Gorges Dam. These are not, these trends, the idea of using a project to attract popular interest and build enthusiasm in a national project, and perhaps even mask problems in other areas, uh, peasant instabi- instability in the countryside or things like that, go back a long ways. It's not something new. They're utilitarian purposes, but they also have other purposes as well. So the persistence of the imperial state, the second one, and much shorter, and I'm getting to an end quickly. Top-down leadership versus bottom-up consensus support. And maybe this is the issue that Terrell's getting at. The problem with China, in Terrell's view, is that they're not democratic that basically it's a state of society where the people at the top make the decisions and then pretend the people at the bottom are supporting them. Um, and I think that's an issue that we, we probably will want to look at. Certainly it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a reasonable charge, um, and it's not new. It, it existed in imperial times and under the Republic administration uh, uh, down to Taiwan up to the time of Jiang Jingguo's liberalizations, the lifting of martial law in the, uh, 1987 and things of that nature. Um, but I think the issue that Terrell brings up, and maybe this is a way to perceive it, is he, he says that the Chinese have ruled without much, if any, recourse to popular mandate. I don't have quotes around it, um, so I don't think that's his quote. I think it's my synthesis. But I think it's, it's fairly true to what he's saying. Uh, the question is, what of the average citizen, what of their voice? Those voices haven't been heard as yet, or they're beginning to be heard, and they're he- heard in areas that I work in, literature or culture, where they come up in films and they're veiled in figurative language and metaphor and irony and things like that. Um, but uh, what also the people of Taiwan, you know, China wants to reunify China, reunify their country and bring Taiwan into the fold. The problem is what about the people of Taiwan? Do they have a voice? That, that is yet to be heard, not to mention the people in Tibet, Xinjiang, or Inner Mongolia. Third point, or third leitmotif, contradictions are worked out. Uh, in this modern world. It's an interesting idea, you know, the idea that you can have a society where people live under a a Leninist state with tremendous controls, but yet they enjoy economic freedom, and so far that seems to be buying a reasonable amount of happiness. 
or keeping people at least who are economically happy uh, satisfied to some extent. Um, this is an interesting concept, and it goes back a long way. Um, those who've had contacts with the Chinese cultural society in a religious setting are very much aware that the Chinese people have a very interesting nexus of beliefs that coexisted throughout Chinese society. Um, Terrell talks a lot about the Chinese legalist synthesis. Those are two philosophies which aren't really fully in harmony with each other. They have antithetical views on the nature of man, for, which I, I think is a core difference. Nonetheless, they've been able to be fit together, just as have uh, Taoism and Buddhism been fit in to, to be able to uh, form some kind of religion that is a nexus of all these different ideas that are somehow, while disparate, able to come up with some kind of whole. Uh, Trell makes the interesting argument, I don't know how you prove it, but it's an interesting idea, that somehow this ability to deal with contradictions somehow may explain why uh, uh, you know, people live in the society, why there is a reasonable amount of uh, you know, harmony among this, in, this, in this state, something we might want to look back at. Well, the question is, and I think uh, Eric brought this up at the beginning, is if Terrell is right, and we use the imperial model, which I don't know that we're supposed to, uh, the question is then how do you deal with this kind of China in a world setting? How is this kind of state going to be able to survive and coexist with other states that, are, that have a, a, perhaps a longer history of, de well, not a longer history, but deal with international relations in a very different way, just as the United States does? How are these stations going to coexist? And maybe the answer is that China isn't quite as imperial as we make it out to be, and we've overextended the argument. In fact, they're much better at dealing with international things. Are they going to be disingenuous? Are they going to continue to manipulate history and geography to their advantage? I'm not sure that we never have done that, but, but, uh, but, uh, but I don't have evidence to say that we have or haven't, so I don't know. I'm sure most nations have at different points stretched things to, uh, to meet their needs. Nonetheless, the question is what's going to happen with, Taiwan, or excuse me, with China in an international setting? Issues such as the Taiwan issue, which is, has a potential of a great deal of interest, not just to China, not just to Taiwan, but to the United States, but to Japan and Korea, who rely on Taiwan uh, very much as a regional trade partner, political partner, and the like. Um, what if, will China succeed in the WTO? Uh, how, how are things going to work there? You know, what about persistence of uh, their persistent claims for Tibet, Turkic regions, and Mongolia? Is this something that's going to be sustained? Will China continue to be able to keep up this uh, this nexus of, of uh, states, or are we going to see some kind of shift there? These are all questions that uh, are worth looking at. Um, finally, one last thing that takes us back to history, and I'll conclude here, um, is the issue of farmer and peasant rebellions. Many of the dynasties were brought down by farmer peasant rebellions that were, that when they came together with uh, natural disasters and things like that, caused a tremendous amount of concern. This is something certainly that China's looking towards. So at any rate, these are some issues, you know, uh, possible things we might want to discuss. And hopefully you'll have something to say too so that you can share your opinions and give us some of your insights. Thanks. Thank you. Before we move on, let's just give a round of applause for our panelists. Appreciate their, their comments and uh, observations and trust that we'll still keep the uh, invitation open to Mr. Terrell. Um, it makes it even more interesting to have him come and, and, uh, and talk to him. Um, I'd like to give the panel just a, a few brief moments if they'd like to uh, comment on one another, if there's anything that they want to say, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Any? Take that as a no. Okay. I couldn't agree more with everybody. Okay. Eric's in agreement with everyone. So questions, your questions, please. Does this work? Mm -hmm. Terrell does talk about something he calls the wronged state, um, which he describes to be the Chinese presenting history as a series of attacks of imperialists, which means us, basically, uh, against Chinese sovereignty, against Chinese way of life, against the Chinese people, a whole litany of offenses. 
And it's not hard. He, he doesn't have to go very far for evidence. Any textbook would begin with the Opium War and portray the United States in particular as one of the, mo the most egregious cultural imperialists with the missionary work and the education system and whatnot. Uh, that's common perception. He had that as part of his argument in the book. It's not something that I made up. It's uh, quite common. And if you look at some of the other examples he uses, even, even things like archaeology, which you'd think would be objective, this is not an interpretation. Are artifacts located here or are they located over there and what do they teach us? Um, China has policies of opening artifacts, uh, archaeological sites, investigating things that they think will cement their official view of history as it's developed over time, and then closing off, especially to foreigners, closing off any archaeological digs that might in any way impinge on it. And he uses the example in uh, Korea, where Korean artifacts have been found in Manchuria. The Chinese won't let any, any scholar into that region. So it's not my idea. It's directly from Terrell. And the other place you see this is with Japan. I think, um, yeah. I've, I've just been rereading the Chinese textbooks, and the first story in the first grade reading primer is an anti-Japanese uh, Second World War story, war, war of Japanese aggression story, where um, the propaganda is to teach these little first graders that the Japanese are the bad guys and we were wrong. The, uh, the whole issue of the textbook controversy between China and Japan is about the ability to control history because it's used as a stick to bludgeon the Japanese every time they show up in China, which automatically gives you a leg up on any negotiations, contracts, whether they be business or political or military. Uh, the Japanese have to walk through the front door with their heads bowed in shame, and there's power there. It's not a ton, but every little bit counts on those stages of negotiation. Another question? Yes. Absolutely. That's a very good question. Uh, as long as the myth is intact that there is a history and that Beijing controls that official version of history, uh, there's always a danger that buried accounts creeping in at the bottom will create disconnect between the Beijing decision makers and the people who supposedly Beijing speaks for. Beijing's always talking about the feelings, hurt the feelings, injured the feelings of the Chinese people. Well, if the Chinese people no longer believe that, then Beijing threatens to alienate itself from its own population. And we've seen in the 20th century a couple of examples where that led to almost instant downfall. 1911, the Qing Dynasty disconnected from its people. One day the Chinese people said, we don't want you anymore. Provinces broke away and the Qing Dynasty lost power. Same exact thing happened to Yuan Shikai. Uh, Beijing, that's one of the reasons why Beijing is so concerned about silly things like internet control and uh, alternative historical voices and why Ross Terrell himself is not allowed to speak openly and freely because you have to control the party line, the official history. At least as long as they're going to continue to play that card, they have to try to maintain some degree of control over what people think. Controlling education helps, but educational concerns have gone to the point where um, they're having to allow even missionaries back into China to set up schools to educate the, the people that need it. And so there's a little bit of slippage. They don't have as much control over that as the past. Actually, I, I can add actually, oh, I was going to say, actually, if I can add to that, on the other side, it behooves other countries to have a better understanding of China because one of the reasons China can get away with things is that other people just don't know the history. That's why people like those of you who are in here who are doing Asia, you know, you have a tremendous advantage. And we need people who understand China well enough to say, look, I know the record well enough to know that this is not true because it puts you, us and other countries, no matter where they are, uh, in position of strength. Knowledge is always a position of strength. Just Chinese are beginning to see, look beyond the government-controlled uh, uh, vision of China. I think many people we run into, not just scholars, but also people on the street beginning to see, are seeing through the, the one China monolithic view of Chinese history. 
Uh, when I was in China, just I guess two weeks ago, I was in the market and I was uh, going through a series of po reprinted posters of the Cultural Revolution or earlier periods. And there was one in particular that I was interested in. I asked him if he had any posters that, that stated, uh, we must liberate Taiwan, because I'd seen those in the past. I wanted to see if they had a reprint. And he shuffled, and sure enough, there is one. You know, I think it was the exact one I was looking for. They said, we, Yi Ding Yao Jie Fang Taiwan, we must liberate Taiwan. And we were negotiating the price, and finally he came down to the price, basically, I wanted to pay for it. And his concluding comment says, well, it's all just Kai Wan Xiao anyway. I mean, it's all just a joke anyway. And so this poor shopkeeper realized that this, all this talk about we must liberate Taiwan is, in a sense, a joke anyway. And... Um, but uh, but I don't want to say that it's it's anything to laugh about. It's a serious issue. But even Chinese are beginning to see the sort of the, this this assertion that we have to liberate Taiwan is, is sort of beginning to wear thin on some Chinese people, even though they're very nationalistic and think Taiwan is part of China. Can I add one thing to that? Um, one thing that's interesting about Beijing is they are extremely careful about and selective about what they allow to kind of fall out of official history and what isn't. You don't see in any Chinese history textbook any account of the Great Famine of 1959-1960. It is not there. It doesn't exist. If you ask any Chinese what happened, they'll tell you that, well, those nasty Soviets left and caused some starvation, and there were uh, weather problems, uh, crop failures, nothing at all about what, say, Jasper Becker would talk about. Same with the Cultural Revolution. It is now being portrayed in the educational system as a very positive upbeat period of time where there was lots of energy and youthful dancing and songs and poems. None of the lessons of history are learned and maybe China will grow old enough to the point where they can come back to that but Chinese are very careful about what is entered into that official history and what isn't. But you have a problem if you control history, if you have eyewitnesses to history who, are, who have lived through it, who have their own version of events. It's been very interesting to watch the post Tiananmen um, coverage of uh, the official history of what happened there is very different than what many people remember. It's been interesting to see people's opinions change as they sort of imbue the official history. But when we were there a couple of weeks ago, just asking two cab drivers, so what did you think ultimately of the student demonstrations? And one, ta one taxi driver gave me the official line, you know, no nation would stand that kind of chaos in its capital. And the second cab driver said, the students did no wrong. And so when you've got eyewitness accounts and living memory, then it's a little bit harder to control exactly what it is that the official history ought to say. One, one final comment, because it ties into a research project I'm doing and just gave a paper on, is that the, this is the 60th anniversary of the end of the War of Resistance against uh, Japan, the Kangrejanjung, or the Second Sino-Japanese War. Um, this event has been played up to the point to tie in with what Dr. Murdoch said to remind the Japanese government that they're still, you know, in position of weakness relative to China, and you know the textbook controversy continues. What's interesting to note is that you know this was not a, a this this heroic. There's a tradition of heroic portrayals of the soldiers in these particular in this particular battle, and the fact that this was a moment of great national glory, and this was used, um, you know, in the 50s in, in in the Republic of China on Taiwan, and it was used at the same time in China. What happened in the years that followed was that writers who had the freedom to create works of literature that were not seen as being representative of anyone but themselves, particularly in Taiwan initially, and in the 90s in China, began to write stories which would take a piece of the war and, and, and boil the war down to one specific little incident. They weren't representative, they didn't claim to be representative of the war of a whole, as a whole, but they were able to take a piece of it and portray it in a less than heroic light to really cast a new spin on these heroic narratives. So, and this is something that's happening, it isn't just unique to this particular case. There are other cases too, including the Cultural Revolution. And these things are beginning to come out. You see them in, in um, fifth generation, sixth generation film, and you see them in other modes of writing too. Comments? Other questions? Yes, the back.
at your tea leaves. Well, let's start with let's start with what Terrell some of his criticisms. He, he he points out several times over and over again in the book that no no nation no state as big as China has ever been ruled uh, uh, in a central fashion. It's always been federation. So he he has seems to have an obsession with federation with a China becoming a federated system as somehow a solution to all its problems. Uh, th remember, the Soviet Union was a federated system, and that was actually very much part of its downfall because uh, this simple, the autonomous republics or independent republics within the Soviet Union could, could easily spin off, and the Constitution gave them the right to do so. So China has never been anything but a centralized system. Uh, so Terrell, I think, sees a federated system. There are a lot of Chinese dissidents, by the way, who also think that federation is the way to go. And there's some press towards that. Now, Terrell points out to the sort of unofficial federation of China in that provinces are becoming economically more powerful and can thumb their nose at the central government. Uh, other Chinese dissidents uh, look with hope. These are dissidents, by the way, who, who are not calling for the overthrow of, of China, of, of the PRC as it is, but the democratization of China. And they put their hopes more on the the evolution which is taking place in the Chinese uh, national, the people's, the people's national assembly, where it is becoming more professionalized, where the people being elected are more sophisticated, they're not simply rubber stamping, and they are beginning to develop a professional staff that give these uh, legislators, representatives, the ability to question government policy. And many dissident Chinese put a lot of hope in the gradual evolution of the National People's Congress as, as a, as a as a method. Increasingly, all Chinese, including the Communist Party, are beginning to look at the press somehow as a watchdog on corruption in government. And a lot of corruption uh, is reported in the newspapers, especially corruption in, uh, uh, you know, uh, kidnapping, uh, extortion, things like this, prostitution, drug rings. All of this stuff is, is, is uh, published quite widely. The corruption that's not published in the papers, of course, is, is official government, ofi official <coughs> high-level government officials who are also corrupt. So you begin to see these directions. So some people are looking toward this evolution towards a, a democratic system uh, based upon the maturity and the development of the, of the People's National Congress and also the press. And there have been debates in China, by the way, also recently about, but these have been put down very quickly, about uh, separating the, the military from the party. The military is controlled by the party. So the idea is that if we, can, if we can separate the military from the party and put the military under the state where it is in every other country, then, then this, then this party ultimately will not have the force of the gun to suppress any anti-party movements, and that would be a step in the right direction. But that's something that they've actually, you can tell that that's being talked about because they've, in recent months, spoken out quite strongly against these kinds of ideas of, of transferring the power of the military. So those are just some ideas, but I don't think we can see what the future is going to hold. At least I can't. <laughs> I, I, of course, can't see what the future is going to hold either, but I think it's important that we be careful about sort of some sort of wide-eyed optimistic assumptions that just because China gets a, a property class or a middle class that they will necessarily then um, become more open and more democratic, or just because you have the internet being more widely used in China that it will necessarily open China to democracy as we understand it. Um, research has shown recently that the attitudes of entrepreneurs, successful entrepreneurs in China actually have harder lines about authoritarian governing structures than many of the people within the government itself. That their, their interests they see are represented by stability and by um, sort of status quo as opposed to any Thing that might change, and um, there's no research to know exactly who's using the internet for what. But if you look at your, I mean, how many of you go to the Al Jazeera websites to see what's happening? To look at the opposition research that's out there, there are some people who are actively mining the internet for alternative ideas. But a lot of internet use, and there are 94 million Chinese now who have internet use, uh, who use the internet regularly. Um, I, I think we, a lot of people extrapolate from that that, oh, we have 94 million freedom fighters who are out there looking for alternative ways to run the Chinese government. And, you know, mostly they're looking at fish prices in Seattle and ec economic applications of what they can find on the Internet. Actually, they're playing StarCraft on Battle.net. <laughs> <laughs> 30, 30 million every night from China to like sign up on games. To organize illegal demonstrations, which the government suppresses. So uh, let me add one thing about th this elite thing. You know, Terrell mentioned several times, he seems to be somewhat enamored with Hong Kong and how 
Hong Kong recently in 2004 by the Wall Street Journal was called the most economically free uh, country in the world. Yeah. Uh, that may be true, but do you know that the, 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 those people in Hong Kong who are the most economically well off, the middle class and upper middle class, are the most pro-Beijing people. They are not pro-democratic. It's all the upper class in Hong Kong that want the stability, that want a strong hand from Beijing to keep the economy stable so they can continue to make money. It's, it, it's, they're not the one. It's not the middle class and the upper class that are pushing for democracy. So this idea that Americans oftentimes entertain that once there's a middle class, once people get wealth, then they want more, they want democracy, they want liberty, is something that just hasn't been played out historically in, mo in, in a lot of places. And, Taiwan, and China may be a case of that. Looking, too, at the peasantry, uh, one of Terrell's contentions with the Beijing regime is that it treats its people like children. He makes that statement several times. If you look at the peasants, in some respects, politically, they are children. In their understanding, a lot of them are illiterate. They uh, have no conception of things beyond their borders. They know if they're dissatisfied, but other than the TV, they really don't have a whole lot of information to make decisions with. So democratization might in some respects, require the peasantry to be brought up to speed. There's always that issue of, well, who do you enfranchise first? If it's just the city people who are educated, who maybe are taxpayers, then how does the countryside respond to that? The splits, the, the sense of entitlement, the sense of disparity could be astronomically destabilizing. And so uh, it's, democratization, to me at least, just doesn't seem to be in the cards for the next several decades. Yes. Um, Dr. Reed mentioned learning more about the history of China from the point of view of outside China so that we could um, understand uh, more so what's going on within the country and thus so, so we can understand it and um, avoid being deceived by their change in history and stuff like that. Um, I was curious what you thought, what could we learn from the recent history of Hong Kong? Becoming a province within China, and what sort of problems are surrounded with that, and what kind of benefits are also coming from it? I, I must say, I was a little bit surprised by Terrell's rather positive view of Hong Kong. I thought maybe that he would sort of challenge uh, the situation in Hong Kong, given his his views of China. Um, the transition on the whole has been relatively smooth, and Hong Kong has continued to prosper. Actually, the night after the transition, the 1997 economic downturn was the hardest thing on Hong Kong, and actually it was the Chinese, those communists that saved the free economy in China by dumping enormous amounts of money into it because Hong Kong was important to China. They wanted to make it, didn't want it to see it go down. And... Um, the issue for me with Hong Kong is there, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of self censorship in Hong Kong. People resigning uh, jobs as editors at newspapers, as reporters at newspapers, simply because they don't want to to uh, to, to to continue to deal with colleagues that censor themselves so that they can retain access to key sources of information in China. And and I think that's a reality in Hong Kong that's a little bit unsettling. That. A lot of Hong Kong people um, have become rather pro-Beijing, but oftentimes just for, for very practical reasons, so that then they can maintain their access to China in, for investments or maintain access to sources if they're journalists. And, and, and so a lot of people don't stand up and really speak out against China anymore. But there are still there is still a very active democratic movement in Hong Kong that continues to speak out. But they're never allowed to travel to China except for a week ago or so, a couple weeks ago, they arranged for them to go to Shenzhen. <laughs> wow, that's like crossing the street from Kowloon to Hong Kong and saying, well, this is China. It's, it's indistinguishable from Hong Kong in many ways. Uh, related to that, one of the concerns, at least among the British, as Hong Kong has gone over to Chinese control, is a complete redefinition of the history of Hong Kong. And Terrell makes the point in his book that uh, the way that Hong Kong is now presented to the Chinese people and to the world as a recovered territory that had always been an entrepot of trade, of economic growth and stability, completely ignoring the role that the British had in building it up from a fishing village, basically a malarial swamp 
into something. And the educational system in Hong Kong reflects that to some degree. One thing that the Chinese did as soon as they took over Hong Kong was to eliminate English as one of the languages of certain schools. The history texts were transformed over that portrayed the British, if it talked about them at all, in a far more unfavorable light, trying to bring Hong Kong and mainstreamize it into this larger official narrative sanctioned by Beijing. And uh, Susan's point about people who know the difference uh, and live to exist or exist as kind of witnesses against this change is in Hong Kong that's huge because everybody that was there before knows the role that the British played and sees the dissonance between what the official history says and what their own experience has claimed. But it's just like Eric said, if things are good, history doesn't matter. History is soft, squishy, it's relative. As long as things are doing all right, then that's fine. And one of, that's one of the concerns that Terrell raises, I believe, is that if we in the West don't preserve somehow an alternative view of history, then at some point the Chinese are able to control memory totally. That gives them tremendous power and tremendous influence. Taiwan's, or sorry, Hong Kong's an interesting case, um, in part because the Chinese are hoping that you know the people in Taiwan will look to Hong Kong as a model of a possible peaceful reunification. And so I think they've been there's there's there there's certain things that they don't like. They don't like large demonstrations. The Chinese do not like large demonstrations in Hong Kong. There are thir- certain things there that worry them. And I think um, as a result, it's a little hard to judge exactly what's going to happen. We don't know what will happen after the 50-year period of kind of one country's two systems expires. It, lo- it will look very good. Um, I think people are far more cautious than they were before. I don't think you see the people who would, uh, particularly people agitating for various democratic innovations, you don't see that much. People are a bit more careful than they used to be, so it's a little hard to judge from Hong Kong what's going to happen because the people there, as Dr. Heyer is saying, are being very careful, and the Beijing government is restraining itself as much as it can, I think. Yes. Most NGOs in China have some official tie to the government. For example, the, the Hope Project Hope in China is actually um, sponsored by the government. And so for every independent organization that might want to function in China, including religion, at the moment there has to be an official connection for that, for that to go forward on any large scale. Small scale things can happen, but across provinces then you need to have the central government involved somehow and official government sanction of what's going on, to my knowledge. That's true. I mean, yeah, that's my understanding. The, the term we oftentimes use in China is not NGO, but GNGO, government, non-government organizations. Because all, 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 the, all NGOs, think tanks, uh, et cetera, p- people I've interacted with, charities, things, uh, all have to be uh, connected to or have a sponsoring institution. And the Chinese have actually recently just published some regulations to, kind of, to tighten up on that. Because uh, they realize that the kind of the NGO activity is getting out of, but the Chinese use this so skillfully. They'll like you go to the All China Women's Federation. This is our big women's NGO. And if people don't know China very well, they think, "Oh, there's NGOs everywhere in China." But you don't realize that these are all, in some cases, just explicitly government organizations. In other cases, certainly GNGOs. There, there are other people that argue that though that um, that these NGOs or these GNGOs are beginning to. Uh, develop methods and means to, to, to preserve a relative autonomy and they kind of know when to hold and when to fold and they know how to expand the envelope and they've been working on and they work on doing that and they know where they, they, when they start bumping up against resistance they know to back off and then they know to when they can move forward and there's been a lot of journals, think tanks that publish journal things that have, that have published some pretty interesting stuff uh, but they kind of have to play carefully and kind of try to fly under the radar and, and, and they're, and they're very becoming very skillful at staying under the radar on these things. And some people argue that, that there is this sort of uh, ratcheting of hypocrisy effect, that the Chinese government will recognize the right of NGOs to exist or these government, non-government organizations, 
But then when these government organizations start acting more independently, the government gets caught in sort of this issue, this kind of what, what we would call the ratchet of hypocrisy, where they take these positions that seem to allow NGOs to exist, and then when they try to clamp down, the people come back on them and say, wait a minute, though, you're trying to take things back that you once granted us, and the government kind of gets caught in this hypocrisy. And some people feel that that, that popularization of norms and ideas and that hypocrisy will eventually come back to haunt the central government, much as it did in the Soviet Union, by the way. Once the Soviet Union signed on to the Helsinki Final Act in 75, allowing non-government organizations to exist legitimately, that's when when Sakharov and all of these people took off, and then the government couldn't back away from it, and these people used this Helsinki Final Act as a cudgel to beat the uh, Soviet government with. And, and, and that could happen in China also, I think. It actually did happen in the late Qing, when the Qing tried to reform following the Meiji Restoration, created those uh, local assemblies, uh -huh. which were then used to bludgeon the Qing. So the more China reforms, the more it undermines itself. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a historical fact and it's a great fear in Beijing. Yeah.